Hello and welcome to this masterclass. My name is Elisa Yanacone and today I'm going to be running you through a little bit of two worlds, one of human rights and more journalistic type stories and how you can also address those through the realm of the imagination and more cinematic kind of filmmaking. The reason that I went into this world uh, goes back to my old film school days. I went to York University in Toronto and wanted to tell stories to see the world. I wanted to learn about different cultures and religions and colors and textures. And I ended up embarking on a many, many country journey, about 50 countries where I just had a suitcase for 10 years and just bounced from one place to another, sometimes telling journalistic stories, uh, sometimes shooting films. And I ended up working for different kinds of media outlets uh, when I covered conflict areas, sometimes BBC, Vice, local media, other times National Geographic when it was more uh, kind of nature environments. But then I always found a way to tell stories of human rights through the realm of the imagination, because I think that mixing these two worlds is part of my passion. And so, the reason that I kind of developed this system, if you will, is because unfortunately I experienced a bit of trauma of my own. So when I was 23 years old, I was sexually assaulted by a cousin and I couldn't shoot anymore. I couldn't pick up a camera. I just graduated university and started a film company and it was going really well. I'd gone back to Mexico to shoot a documentary and unfortunately all of this happened and so when I went back to Canada I found that the Canadian government suggested I should go to art therapy which at the time was something I didn't even know existed and I was put into a program with other women that had experienced similar kinds of violence and I realized that in a moment where words failed images were a great way to communicate and sometimes we would play with plasticine or collage or work with fabrics and little by little I found that things that I was unable to communicate because I was still really stuck in the trauma of everything that had happened was starting to come out through drawings through sometimes a little bit of movement uh, through sound and when I started to hear other people's stories it kind of made me more willing to open up about my own story after this, I started having an image that was staying in my mind, and that was of being in a dark space, completely bare, with this concept of broken wings. And they weren't so much so broken as they were just completely unusable structures coming out of my back. So they looked like these antler-shaped things that had once had feathers, but they were no longer usable, so they'd shed all those feathers, and everyone else was still flying, but I was stuck, and I was never going to be able to pick up my life again. And I had this image so prevalently for such a long time and I thought, well, you know, I, I know how to execute, how to photograph, how to shoot. Um, I should make this image come to life. And then I thought, actually, you know what? There must be other people out there that have gone through the same thing that perhaps have their version of broken wings. So I connected to rape crisis centers and different kinds of organizations, uh, psychologists, etc., and then ended up getting a lot of people, like different kinds of survivors, just writing to me. And every time I'd send out an email and this was passed on, my phone would just keep buzzing. And I discovered that actually, no, people didn't have so many images of broken wings. They had their own images that had nothing to do with that. Maybe somebody had a red classic convertible car. Maybe somebody felt that they were stuck in a cage. Um, maybe somebody thought of, uh, crazily in my mind, a, a pink plane or these kinds of images. And once I started learning about these stories, I realized so much of trauma is ingrained in our mind and the way that we process things doesn't necessarily have to be literal. It doesn't have to be what happened, how it happened. It sometimes is an extrapolation from that. And so I decided to become a bit of a visual translator for stories of trauma. So I obviously started with sexual violence and did a rather long series called The Spiral of Containment Rapes Aftermath, where I did speak to 25 rape survivors around the world, male, female, different kinds of religious backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, and translated how we were each made to feel through magical realism or the realm of the imagination. And once I completed that, I realized, you know what, this is something you can do with any kind of trauma. 
But uh, I started working with prisoners of war. So I got contacted by an organization in Cameroon and they said, um, you know, actually some prisoners of war had taken a phone into prison and contacted me and said, can you tell our story in this way? I don't even know how they came across the work. I don't even know how they got the phone. But the point is, um, I started partnering with an organization and we started telling these stories. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't go to Cameroon myself, but I could speak to the people that were behind bars. And when I started listening to their stories, I realized so much of the aftermath of trauma and the thick of trauma is relatable across you know, countries, it doesn't matter where you are, these feelings that people experience are so connected internationally. And so I worked with uh, refugees, exiles, people from Cameroon that were in South Africa, found an old apartheid prison and translated how the people that were behind bars were being made to feel. They recurrently spoke about being treated like animals, about being faceless, like nobody cares what our name is. We feel abandoned in cells. We feel like we're gonna spend all this time here and we're never gonna be able to get out. And so we worked with traditional Cameroonian attire, Cameroonian masks, um, and also found stories to tell locally in South Africa of people that had been displaced from Cameroon. And I don't know if you've ever seen the classic silhouetting in documentaries and in different kinds of sensitive uh, stories. I really wanted to find a new way to anonymize people that didn't have to do with silhouetting. And so in order to do that, I actually uh, went down to textiles and, and masks. So people that were in South Africa had their own costumes from Cameroon. And I used traditional shui shui fabric as the backdrops for them to be set against telling their story of displacement through the fabric itself. And then the masks sometimes were Cameroonian, sometimes were from Congo, for example, because there was a person that was displaced from Cameroon to Congo to several other countries to get there. After doing that, I just kept going with it. And now I've worked with kids with chronic illness and uh, different kinds of children that have experienced severe trauma. And this is what I'm going to continue doing. One thing I have found when you're pursuing this kind of career is that people often want to fit you into boxes. You are either a cinematographer for blonde hair, or you are a director for narrative stories that have to do with a particular kind of topic. And this crossing of spheres and spaces becomes a challenge to explain to people. And I feel like I'm the anti-boxer. I don't like being just one thing. And I really believe that everything informs the other. And I'll make a rather extreme example here, but when I was in university, I shot weddings and this is how I was making some money on the side. And a lot of people go like, oh, weddings. But honestly, I feel like so many of the skills that I learned shooting weddings came in so handy when I was covering conflict because you have those instances in a wedding where the vows are only going to come once, right? You're not going to ask them to say it again. You got to be on your A game and things are happening so quickly. You got to capture those moments uh, in the middle of the chaos and the commotion. Sometimes you have to deal with different kinds of emotions. You have some weddings that go swimmingly and you have other ones that don't really and learning to start kind of getting your feet wet into navigating emotions, navigating um, how to get really close to the action without becoming the action, right? All of these little skills actually are very helpful. And if you take conflict and you take that and then you apply it to narrative, I mean, who doesn't love a DP that can work quickly in narrative, right? We're always against the clock. We're always trying to set up everything quickly. And it's about trying to understand how all of these things connect, right? When you're doing narrative film uh, or the realm of the imagination, you're, you're thinking colors, you're thinking textures, you're, you're growing in your technical craft, right? And when you're thinking of human rights and social justice, you're also becoming, I find, a, a better human. You're, you're more able to connect with stories. And when you have that empathy towards other humans, when you're trying to apply that to storytelling in a more creative kind of way, you can think, oh my God, I remember how this felt even for me. How do I recreate that through my images? What kinds of colors? What kind of frame rate? What, what's actually going to help me take an audience to a place of what I experienced and I witnessed here or what this person tell me that they saw? So I actually feel that they all inform each other and 
getting into a little bit of it all is actually never going to be a hindrance. Even shooting a music video where you can really let your imagination go wild, I find a wonderful experience because then it means that when you're trying to tell a human rights story, you go, but why should I cap my imagination? But why should I cap their storytelling imagination if, if we can actually use all of this? So all I would say is, if you have an interest in telling stories in this kind of particular way is don't be scared to go into areas that other people might go, well, that's a little crazy. No, try it out because you never know in what moment you're going to pull strings from that and really use them for something completely different. So we just flew into Krakow in Poland this morning because obviously there are no direct flights into Ukraine. So the route is to come into Poland and then sometimes take a train. In our instance, we're going to be taking a bus into Lviv and we'll have to see how long it takes at the border. Sometimes it can be fairly quick, sometimes it can take many, many hours. So we'll just have to play it by ear, stay nimble. You never know how these things are going to go and always be prepared for the unexpected. I've connected with a children's hospital there where the intent is to try and translate how kids are feeling right now, how the war has impacted them, and how we can express that through the realm of the imagination. And at the same time, we're going to work on a journalistic piece to see how we would prepare for each of these two things and how they differ and how they come together. I generally tend to think that these two worlds inform each other. When you create based on truth, based on something that has true social human impact or meaning, I find that the work just always tends to be that much more impactful. It's great because it can actually build empathy, it can build community, and that's where I like grounding my stories. I love magical realism, probably because I'm Mexican and I grew up with these kinds of stories and literature. Um, the notion that you can sometimes exaggerate something or tell, tell something in, in a grandiose kind of way to convey a real truth in a story fascinates me. To, to think that you can be so miserable that you're drowning and therefore executing that image instead of the literal, you know, journalistic kind of elements of that story. Or if a child dreams of floating away in a balloon in a hospital because he's stuck on dialysis. Like, I want to see those parts of someone's brain and still tell really interesting, powerful stories, but in a way that also doesn't give compassion fatigue. And that's another element that I think is really interesting is that we live in a world where we have a bombardment of images every moment of the day. If it's not social media, it's the news, it's a paper, it's a magazine, it's a billboard. And we have to digest all of this, right? And so some of the things that are most powerful and that need our attention the most get lost in the noise. And so trying to find a way to turn audiences which are seemingly passive back into a curious, active audience is a bit of a challenge. And I find that when you're addressing these kinds of stories in this way, in this more imaginary realm kind of way, it makes the audience curious and go, what's that story about? Why, why did this happen? Why is that translated with a floating elephant? You know, what's going on here? And, and suddenly you actually realize, you know, Yes, there's a lot of apathy, but I think a lot of people really care. They just have no idea what to do and there's no way to really engage with work without me feeling awful, right? Without me feeling like, oh, there's people dying here, there's nothing I can do. And at least this way you can allow to start the dialogue to really see, you know, to have people question like, maybe I could do something, maybe I could help someone. And, and so for me, it's quite exciting to see these worlds converge. Obviously, when you're going into a challenging area, like I said, tomorrow we're going off to Ukraine. We're going to a rather safer part of Ukraine, which is the western side in Lviv, so we're not going to be traveling very far. But even going to a part like that, we need to prepare in advance. We're still going to a war area, and we need to make sure that we're ticking all our boxes in terms of safety. So later on, we're going to be talking about what kind of equipment we should be bringing into these kinds of things, what considerations you need to have, how to prepare. But basically, in a nutshell, that's what this masterclass is going to be about. That's the kind of work that I do. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me in social media. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about how it was that I ended up shooting conflict and different kinds of humanitarian crises. And to be honest, when I first set out to do filmmaking, I don't think I imagined exactly where I was going to end up. But the one through line that I always kept was that I wanted to witness humanity in all of its facets. I think in the earlier stages of my career, I was deeply influenced by James Natchway's work. I remember seeing some of his photographs of 
places that I could only imagine uh, of going to and learning about so many situations that I had no idea were going on in the world. And he had this terminology called witness photography and the concept that it's so important to be there to witness what is going on. And in my mind, I thought this is an incredible life purpose. I really want to do this. I think also growing up in Mexico, you know, I, I became an EMT in an ambulance from a very early age. And uh, at 16 years old was dispatching the ambulances and I eventually got to ride in them. And, and I remember being exposed to quite a lot of violence and quite a lot of challenging things even when I was a teenager and I was always drawn to this um, but I wanted to be prepared because I like to prepare I'm, I'm one of those people that does like to have some level of control when I can have it and so I wanted to actually study conflict areas so I did my my master's degree in international journalism with specialism in conflict zones and wanted to learn what I should do to go in and the first thing I was told to do, which I would recommend everyone does, is take a hostile environment training course. And that was something I did in the UK. And it's a fantastic thing to do because basically you get put into scenarios and different kinds of situations uh, that can happen when you're operating in these areas. So what happens if you were to get kidnapped? for example, or what happens if you're ambushed or if somebody points a gun at you or basically if anything goes wrong, right? What kinds of behaviors can you adopt? What kinds of things can you do? And I think that it's an excellent way to kind of get a sense of what things could be like. The second piece of advice that I got twice, once when I did my film school degree and then when I did my master's was if you want to shoot, shoot. That was the first one which got me going to all these different countries and places. And it was just about finding a camera and going. Like there really doesn't have to be that much of a stumbling block. If you don't have money, because I don't have it, you just find a way. You literally hitchhike, you literally, and I'm not saying people should be hitchhiking, but that's kind of what I did do a lot. Hostels, like it was really rudimentary kinds of things. But as soon as I started doing that, people started to think of me as like, oh, this is, the, the woman, the cinematographer that will shoot and travel. And I wanted people to know that about me and suddenly you're hired and suddenly you're doing all these kinds of things. And so it was about building a portfolio of exactly what I wanted to do um, whilst eventually finding a way to monetize that, right? And then another part of the process was if you want to cover a conflict area, just go and try it out, you know? And, and eventually you do have to jump in. There's only so much preparation you can do. I think at the stage that I went, which was after my master's, I feel like I'd been preparing for a very long time because even though I hadn't been shooting conflict or humanitarian crises per se, a lot of the documentary work that I was doing was dealing with incredibly sensitive topics, lots of vulnerable populations, um, going to really remote areas. And so there was that component. Then there was having worked in, in ambulances. And then I think there was this just general desire to learn about humans in, in different conditions, right? And so I ended up going to Egypt and this was back in 2013. And I didn't actually know uh, what was gonna happen then, but just to kind of situate us in history, the first democratically elect president of Egypt, Mohamed Morsi, was coming into power, right? And he eventually got deposed by the military. The head of the military, Sisi, is now the president of Egypt. And so basically when I was there, there were all these protests uh, starting to emerge in Cairo about the fact that this president had been deposed. And he was part of the Muslim Brotherhood Party. So a lot of Muslim Brotherhood supporters had come to Cairo to protest about this going on. At the same time, I was actually working on my final master's project in the City of the Dead, which is actually a necropolis in Cairo, where basically you have a massive kind of multi-kilometer graveyard area and you have a lot of people living in this part. So that's called a necropolis and there's quite a few of them around the world. And so I was already trying to work in this and immersing in it whilst all this political thing was going on. So I started to do that. Um, I made a network of really strong friends and colleagues and I think that's a really important thing when you go to these kinds of areas is really connect with people because they'll have your back, you'll have their back and for years to come you'll be connected. I still chat to these friends and um, we were in dire circumstances together and so that bonds you. Um, and so I ended up starting to shoot there, starting to freelance and that's when I started to really kind of pick up this kind of work, right? 
I realized that I really enjoyed it. And so after that, I moved to other different countries to cover challenging environments. Um, and then slowly but surely, and this is where I started shifting gears, I realized that I didn't only want to arrive to a place, find people in their worst moment of trauma, point a camera at them, and then tell that story. Because I felt that, yes, that's witnessing, yes, that's raising awareness, but at the same time, having been through art therapy myself and having experienced how that helped me, I felt like there was more that could be given back. And so I started mixing these two worlds and listening in a journalistic capacity to what stories people had, what trauma they had experienced, but then turning them into collaborators to express their story. And I find that this is also about shifting power back to survivors of any kind of violence or trauma, um, because so much of trauma is about having your power taken away from you. And if you can use your skill set to shift some of that power back and actually see someone in their healing journey, it doesn't mean that they're going to be, oh, I, I'm done with all my problems. It simply means that you're actually a little part of their puzzle to shifting in their healing journey and, and continuing in that. Um, that felt like it just fit. It really clicked with my personality. And so now I will still go to conflict areas. I will still go to humanitarian crises, but I tend to curate that much more than I used to. And I tend to try to find angles that have got to do with human rights stories that can be told in this way. And this is actually what we're going to go do in Ukraine. Uh, we're going to go to a children's hospital where we're going to tell a more purely journalistic story to see the impact of the war uh, as, as experienced through the eyes of children and doctors and nurses at this hospital. But then we're also going to spend some time with the children to try and understand how they're processing these things. And I have no idea what we're going to find and I have no idea how this is going to go. Um, but I think that to me, this is going to be quite fulfilling and I can only hope that the people that we work with in that way as well, that they will feel like something special has happened for them as well. And, and I really like that kind of collaboration and giving and taking and, you know. So hopefully you will enjoy it and we're off on the journey.